Hello and welcome back to another episode of the For the Property Investor podcast. And of course, we're back with the weekly news with the uh, the only man that can bring us the news is Nick Bendel. Welcome, Nick. Well, thank you for having me, Owen. And um, how's, how's your week been in the past week? Anything exciting happening? Oh, if you're asking me whether anything exciting has happened to me, you're asking the wrong person. I'm the most boring person and I lead <laughs> the most boring life. Oh, come on. Uh, that, don't you work with like mortgage brokers, financial planners and, and property people? Exactly. So they're the exciting ones. Oh, right. They're the exciting ones. Okay. But, but, but that makes your life exciting. Well, one of them did have something exciting, which oh, cool. excited me. Uh, so my business, Hunter and Scribe, it's a copywriting agency. And as he said, we write content for finance and property professionals. And one of the things we do is award submissions. We're really, really good at awards. I've written many award submissions. I've been an awards judge. It's something we're really, really good at. And we recently helped a financial advisor with an award submission. And he contacted me last week to mention that he had been nominated as a finalist for his particular award, which I was excited about. And, and I hope uh, the big day in December that he gets announced as the winner. Fantastic. Fantastic. Um, and uh, I, I think you should get the award. Well, I, 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 uh, I'll have to run that by him and see how he replies. I, I think we've run, we, I think we've um, done this before, haven't we? It's just like it, there should there should be a um, a um, an awards night for people who write awards submission submissions. There should, um, but then the question is, who would write our award submissions to enter these awards? Oh well, yeah, you would have to write your own, yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that's where the business model falls apart. Uh, maybe maybe we could just outsource it to each other. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's getting a bit too much. Okay, and how has your week been? Oh, well, it's, um, yeah, it's uh, not, nothing too interesting, just um, plodding along with property management. Um, oh, we, we might be getting uh, uh, a new region. Well, not quite a new region, but... Um, uh, we, we've been operating in Tamworth in New South Wales for for um, most of this year, um, and um, we might be getting our first one up the road in Armadale. So um, it's um, it'd be nice to spread the wings just a little bit and um, yeah, into Armadale. So um, yes, and, and there's a lot happening in that in that um, part of the world uh, with new development and. Um, uh, the local economy is uh, growing strong. So, Armadale is a really beautiful town. I really like it. Mm, yeah. So, yeah, that's all my news. So, but let's get into the the weekly news. Uh, what have you got for us? We've got three very interesting stories, and the first one is broker association calls for stamp duty reform. The FBAA oh. has proposed two changes to stamp duty to make it easier for people to buy property in its submission to a Senate inquiry into home ownership in the country's financial regulatory framework. The first uh, change the FBAA proposed was to make it easier for first home buyers to enter the market. They should be, quote, exempt from stamp duty up to realistic limits based on current house prices. And the second idea, to make it easier for owner occupiers to trade up and thereby free up more entry level homes for first home buyers, repeat home buyers should pay stamp duty only once on an amount of money. For example, if their first home costs $1 million and their second home $1.5 million, they should st pay stamp duty on only the extra $500,000 with their second purchase rather than the full $1.5 million. Owen, what do you think of the FBAA's first idea to make first home buyers basically exempt from stamp duty? Well, um... <laughs> I mean, isn't that pretty much the case already? Well, I guess it's state by state. And yeah. there are some discounts, but uh, I think still quite a few stamp, uh, quite a few yeah. first time buyers are paying stamp Because they have set up, up, up to certain levels um, uh, to be exempt from, 
you know, with realistic limits based on current house prices. Um, and um, yeah, yeah, so it's, um, I mean, it's it's not a not a bad idea. I, I mean, uh, I mean, the best idea is let, let's just make stamp duty free for everyone. You know, it's just like, I mean, it's a stupid tax anyway. But um, uh, then there's the problem of um, a loss of revenue for state governments. We'll get to that in a moment. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so for first home buyers, uh, I mean, yes, everyone wants to help first home buyers get into the market. Um, but, um, you know, again, it's, um, uh, that's just in the short term issue, it's, that's just going to fuel more demand, um, and push prices up further. Yeah. What about the what about FBAA's the second idea, uh, to limit the amount of stamp duty that owner occupiers pay as they trade up? What do you think of that? Yeah, not not a bad idea. Um, it uh, makes sense, and um, but uh, again, you know, it's um, uh, yeah. How do we fund the the, the loss of revenue? Mm, okay, well then, uh, that's a nice segue um, to what's happening in the ACT. So an, another option is to phase out stamp duty altogether. In 2012, the ACT began a 20-year process to phase out stamp duty. Instead, property owners will have to pay higher council rates, which the ACT government assumes investors will pass on to their tenants. And the ACT prefers this system because it means people will no longer be discouraged from moving and because the money previously raised from the small percentage of people who buy a home each year will be distributed among the wider population. So what do you think of that plan, Owen? Um, it's, um, it, it, it could work. It's, um, I've, I've seen worse. Um, it's, uh, but yeah, for, firstly, you're, you're, um, you're telling another tier of government to raise their taxes, um, and to be able to pay for your cutting taxes. Um, you know, how a ratepayer is going to be, um, okay with that. It, it's, it's effectively imposing a land tax, um through a uh, separate um tier of government um which, which is is workable and and uh, and that's always been my thought process of let's get rid of this um uh, gatekeeper tax called stamp duty and um and have a a broader based land tax ongoing um now if that's a combination between um uh, state government land tax, as well as um, maybe local councils raising their rates. Um, yeah, so be it. Um, but um, yeah, uh, how, how are the state governments, or in this case the the um, uh, ACT, going to be able to um, uh, yeah replace the revenue loss from from reducing or phasing out stamp duty altogether? um yeah no, not uh, there's a there's a, a lot of things seem to be missing um uh, but this topic is one of my favorite topics stamp duty is a stupid tax um it provides absolutely no value other than um revenue raising um and um yes reform needs to be done because it stops the um liquidity of the property market and um, if we were to ha have a, a, a tiered, uh, so a, at least a reduced stamp duty system um, with maybe a broader base land tax and, and maybe a, a, um, a, a reworking of the, the, the tiers of um, stamp duty, so it's lower on the lower end property values and higher on the higher end property values and same, same with land tax. And with maybe different tiers for for owner occupier, uh, investor, and for different values as well. So, um, yeah, it it definitely needs some uh, reforming. Mm, well, if just to uh, pluck a number out of thin air, if a state is getting one billion dollars a year from stamp duty, and the state wants to get rid of stamp duty, it needs to either raise a billion dollars in other taxes or it needs to reduce services by a billion dollars worth or a combination of the two. So either way, taxpayers have to accept either paying different taxes or more taxes or reduced services, but taxpayers one way or the other have to cop it. 
Yes, and stamp duty is a is a major revenue for state governments, and so there would have to be a lot of services cut so um, to be able to replace that. So, yeah. Let's move on to our second story. Unemployment remains low. The national unemployment rate in September was just 4.1%, the same as the previous month, according to the latest data from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Commenting on the result, the Commonwealth Bank said, quote, jobs growth has been remarkably strong, end quote, which might affect the timing of the Reserve Bank's first rate cut. To quote CBA again, Overall, the recent labour market data does not strengthen the case for the RBA to commence normalising the cash rate this calendar year. Indeed, at the margin, it weakens it. That means the conviction we had in our call for a 25 basis point December cut to the cash rate has dipped. But while the risk has firmly shifted to a later start date for the first reduction in the cash rate, we stick with our call. In other words, CBA still believes the first RBA rate cut will occur in December. Oh, and I'm not going to ask you to kind of make predictions, but I'm wondering, what are the risks of the RBA cutting rates too early? Well, uh, you cut too early, then you fan the inflation flame and um, it starts to take off again. Um, and when you've got, um, even though there are a lot of people hurting out there, um, and it's still not necessarily flowing through to the jobs market. We've still got a, a strong labour market, strong jobs market. Um, and um, yeah, it's not like um, companies are, are um, laying off hundreds and thousands of people. Uh, there are some isolate, isolated cases of that, which is why the unemployment rate has been ticking up. Uh, but it's 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 not um, exploding like the inflation rate did in pre in the previous few years. What about the flip side of that? What are the risks of the RBA cutting rates too late? Cut it too late, and then we um, dip into inflation, and uh, sorry, dip into recession, and um, we um, then we see the unemployment rate um, really skyrocket. Uh, so it, it is a balancing act. Well, exactly. And you've highlighted the problem for the RBA. It's a very fine line they're walking. They've made this point numerous times. They don't want to go too early and they don't want to go too late, but it's so hard to time. I mean, I'm not going to ask you to speculate on whether the RBA will cut rates this year, but do you think the RBA should cut rates this year? Uh, well, as the CBA has commented, they, they, uh, they're calling... Uh, 25 um, point cut in December and which is really only six weeks away mm. um, and the the property market is hurting at the moment uh, so you can see prices coming down there's a lot more stock on the market so people are hurting in the property market but that's not the the the, the only reason uh, that the RBA will um, change interest rates because of the property market. There's a lot more factors at play. Um, they're mainly concerned about inflation and the um, cost of um, cost of goods and the cost of living increasing. So it's, um, it, it, there's, I think there's a very small chance that it'll happen in, in December. It's more likely it'll be um, uh, early in the new year and uh, with February or March, uh, because we need to see that inflation figure come down and stay down uh, for a good quarter before they're probably confident to be able to um, um, cut rates. If you were governor of the Reserve Bank, and I think sooner or later that will happen, uh, <laughs> would Thanks, you Nick. make the first rate cut in late 2024 or in early 2025? Well, I, I don't have all of the information uh, that the RBA has. Um, so, but um, from reading the room, I, I, I think it will be um, uh, early in the new year. Okay. Well, I know for a fact that the RBA board listens to our podcast and before each monetary policy meeting, they always review our last few episodes just to decide what they should do. Of so, course. 
I know that they will be replaying this conversation at their next monetary policy meeting, which is actually quite flattering that they pay so much attention to us. Yeah, yeah, it it is absolutely, and it's just like uh, uh, it's. I, I'd, I'd like to um, get some confirmation of, of um, where you where you got this information from uh, at some stage. So, but uh, later date, off air. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, look, I, I can't say it hasn't been officially reported to me, but I think it's. Just oh, common, okay. I think it's just common okay. sense they'd be listening to our podcast. Oh, okay. Well, well, yes, it would be common sense um, because, yeah, everyone does and should. Yeah. Exactly. So <laughs> let's move on to our third and final story. Uh, and this time we're discussing Parliament, which is quite appropriate because I know that all the parliamentarians also listen to our podcast. Yes, and of course. Our- and, and probably <laughs> King Charles while he's here too. Yeah. <laughs> You'd assume so. You would assume so. Uh Hello, Your Majesty, uh, if you're listening. Well, sorry, not if you're listening. Oh, I know you are. Uh, uh, opposition Senator calls for more for mortgage reform. The Shadow Assistant Minister for Home Ownership, Andrew Bragg, has said we should consider two changes to lending and banking rules to help more first-home buyers enter the market. First, Parliament should set the rules for mortgages, not APRA. Quote, Of course, we need advice from independent experts and it's sensible to have operational independence for APRA, but these issues are too important to delegate entirely, Senator Bragg said. Second, Senator Bragg says we should change the APRA serviceability buffer because it's currently one size fits all. Quote, it might make sense to have a 3% buffer when the official cash cash rate is 1%, but much less so when it's set at 4.35%. The buffer is bad news for prospective first home buyers, and it can also create mortgage prisons where refinancing is impossible, he said. Owen, let's start with his first recommendation. Should mortgage regulation shift from APRA to the politicians? Mm, Can I just use one word? It's no. (laughs) It's, oh, it's... Um, yeah, no. Um, it, it, the system's not broken. Um, it's um, politicians have fiddled enough with um, mortgage um, um, regulation. Um, it's overregulated. It's uh, overgoverned. Um, it's overcompliance. Um, so it, it's um, th- there's already. Uh, too much government involvement in in the mortgage industry so it's uh, it was very much needed at one point um and but now it's 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 gone for, it's gone too far mm. i i mean people can argue about whether the APRA serviceability buffer is right or wrong uh but i guess this is a different question which is who should be the one setting the buffer and you seem to be saying it should be APRA setting the buffer, not politicians. Yeah, it it's, um, definitely should be APRA. Um, they're talking to the banks all the time. Um, they're, they're knowing what's happening in, in, in the market. Um, I mean, he, he quotes, you know, when, when the official cash rate is 1%. Well, uh, apart from the last four years, well, when, when has cash rate been 1%? Mm. Uh, yeah before then it was never so so he's talking about a one-off you know once in a lifetime event um and it's it probably we we probably won't see rates that low again ever it's um um so yeah when when rates are eight nine ten percent and and it's only a three percent buffer then it's just like um yeah, yeah, and, and I Ami mean, was talking about when rates are four percent, and yeah, should there be a three percent buffer? It's just like, well, what, what, what about when they're eight, nine, ten percent? You know, it's and they're only a three percent buffer. Maybe they should be higher at um at, at that point. So it's it's either it needs to be the same at the same uh, for for everyone all at the same time um, because um, yeah, it's. Y- 
and, and APRA needs to be the one that controls that because that, they can see the delinquency rates. They can see because uh, it needs to be something that can be changed uh, at will and um, not by a politician to be able to um, win votes and um, and not waiting for uh, politicians to um, pass it through parliament. What about Senator Bragg's other suggestion, which is that the APRA serviceability buffer should be changed? What do you think of that? Yeah, no, well, it, it's, um, as I was just saying, the, the um, uh, keep it the same the whole time. It needs, to, APRA needs to be the one that controls it um, because, um, you know, we, we've had historic low interest rates, which we're, we're not going to ever see again. Um, and um, so we're, we're, we're at a point where um, APRA needs to be the one that controls it, not politicians who are trying to win votes by um, uh, helping people borrow more to be able to get into their, their property. So Senator Bragg says these mortgage reforms would for help first-time buyers, even if we assume for the sake of the argument that he's right. Are there other things we could do that would have a bigger impact on first-time buyers? Um, yeah, the bigger thing is just more more supply of property um, to be able to um, um, give people more choice and uh, give them the opportunity to get into a property. And um, that's first and foremost. And so that we can um, stop the, the, the rise of property values as much as they are by having more supply in the market. Yes. Uh, and I know we've discussed this many times before. If people... When people say that there's a first home buyer problem, what they mean is that it's too hard for first home buyers to enter the market. And what they mean by that is it's too expensive for first home buyers to enter the market. And what they mean by that is demand is too high. And if demand is too high, then the only option is to increase supply. So to the extent that people believe that there's a first home buyer problem, it really is a supply problem. And yeah. if people are proposing non-supply solutions, then it seems like they're only tinkering around the edges. Yeah. Well, you're right. Plenty <laughs> for the Reserve Bank and our politicians, and of course, His Majesty to mull over. Yes, obviously. And, um, you know, hopefully um, the King has some time to um, make some public comment about it before he leaves. I'd be very surprised if he doesn't comment on that front. <laughs> very true. Well, even though he doesn't like to get in, involved in domestic politics or issues too much. He, no, but um, I, I, I think the Afro, Afro service ability buffer would be an exception to that. Okay. Yeah, quite possibly, quite possibly. So, well, Nick, thanks for bringing the news once again uh, this week. And uh, we look forward to um, seeing what happens next week on the um, For the Property Investor podcast with the weekly news. See you then.